Deandra, thanks for jumping on the Volleyball University podcast for today. Um, just before I begin uh, kind of talking to you, I'm just going to tell like people who are watching right now the basic summary so they know to stick around for this one. So Ginger Thanks. basically is uh, a volleyball player that um, was told by her teammates and her coaches that she was not going to play in college. Uh, she's an undersized setter, so um, she kind of took that to heart and eventually started playing at a D2 school, transferred to a different D2 school, and then now she's officially playing D1 volleyball. So um, in this episode, we're going to talk about kind of her journey, um, things she did in order to get recruited, uh, even though others kind of doubted her. And that's pretty much it. So, uh, so Ginger, if you want to start by just telling us maybe a quick intro for yourself and, and then we'll kind of go from there. Sure. Um, I'm Ginger. I'm 20 years old um, and I'm currently playing at Towson University, which is located in Towson, Maryland. And this is my third institution. And like you said, I'm I'm a setter. I'm 5'8". Yeah, so five eight. Yeah, I uh, I'm also five eight, and I'm undersized as well. How about we talk about like like obviously you're in a good spot right now. You're playing D one. Um, how is it going so far? Transitioning to like the highest level. I would say that if I had one word to describe it, it would just be overwhelming. Like I'm I'm constantly overwhelmed just because the pressure is so different that you're it's constantly on you in, in all aspects, athletics, academics. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's so intense. Like the level of intensity is so much higher and um, but it's definitely a lot of fun. And if you love it, you know, it's a ton of fun and there's a lot of resources at the D one level. So it comes with a lot of benefits as well. Um, True. I do really love it. I'm really enjoying it. I'm just, it's taking a little bit for me to get acclimated to the, to the pressure, but it, yeah, I do really, I'm enjoying it so far. Right. And you, you just got there, I think this semester, right? So it's been yes. a couple, maybe a couple months now or a couple of weeks, right? So it's yes. relatively new to you, uh, which makes sense. Uh, so let's kind of like, let's, we're going to get back to that, but let's talk about kind of the beginning of your volleyball career. So when did you like start playing? How did that come about? Sure. Um, my mom was obsessed with signing me up for extracurricular activities, even if they had nothing to do with me as a person. So I did like robotics and tennis and like skateboarding and the most random stuff. And one day she signed me up for volleyball and I had zero interest in being a part of it. And I, I think I was 10 years old when she signed me up for it. And I, I went and I fell in love with it. By the end of the day, I was like, OK, I want to do this hundred percent and I haven't really stopped since. So that's how I started. Awesome. And then I'm, I'm assuming like, when did you start playing like club blah, blah, officially, for example? Cause that would I be think the, the first year that I played club, I think I was 13. Okay. So you did like two years of camps, clinics and whatnot. And then 13s was your first year playing club. Yes. And I think my the first goal I ever had was to make JV and I don't think I made JV until ninth grade so it was definitely late um and my next biggest goal like my life goal was to make varsity and so I, I ended up making varsity the next year so I played varsity 10th 11th and 12th while playing club at the same time awesome and I just asked this in general because I usually ask my guests this but like at least where I'm from it seems like club volleyball takes precedent over high school volleyball is just more important right now. It seems like, is that the, the same case for you? Did you care about both equally or how, how'd that go for you? I definitely cared about both equally, but I would say that club volleyball was a bit uh, more competitive. Um, yeah. just, just the schedule, the tournaments, um, the competition, things like that. You know, when you're in high school, you play the same teams in your conference every year. So you already know what to expect. Um, but club volleyball, it took me, a, it was a rocky start for me because of how much more competitive club volleyball was. So I definitely felt a little bit more pressured when it came time for club season. But I think high school was just more like friends that you go to class with and you get to play volleyball after school together. And then club is really where the competition sets in. Right. Yeah. No, I think that's definitely true. And I actually, that you make a good point. Like you do play the same teams every year of the same yeah. like people the same age so eventually you kind of figure it out but yeah, yeah. I know you can talk about that way but club is it, it can be different each year for sure right? yeah yes um so with that being said uh next question is like when did you decide 
like in your head that you wanted to play like college ball? Because you know, I know you want to make JV, you want to make varsity, but like at what point were you like, I kind of want to do this more than just high school? I found out really late in the game that college volleyball was a thing. Um, I I didn't even know about it until maybe like I was 15. Um, and as soon as I found out that it was a thing, I was like, why wouldn't I continue playing on? Like if I can do this thing I love while I'm getting my college degree, like that, that sounds like a dream. So right. originally in my head, for some reason, being from Florida, I just pictured myself playing for the University of Florida. So whenever I thought about playing college volleyball, that was like what I imagined. Yeah. And I thought it would be a, a tryout situation where you'd pick the university and then try out for the team. So I just had it in my mind that I was going to be trying out <laughs> to play for University of Florida. But as I learned more that it's it's not that's not what it is, I think my the first coach I ever had that told me that it was possible for me to play in college I was 16 and she was the she was the first person where she she actually sat us all down and she was like what are what are y'all's dreams and I was like I want to play in college and every other coach I had before that kind of told me it was either going to be almost impossible or completely impossible to do that um, but she was the first coach that was like, okay, let's get started. Like we've got a lot of work to do, but, but it's definitely possible for anybody. Yeah. I love that's, that. That's really when I knew I wanted to pursue it, especially cause I, that was the first time someone made me feel like I actually could. So it's, it was a, you know, fast track since then. Yeah. You know, it reminds me of, uh, I was looking at, I think I saw this quote the other day, but it's like, it, it only takes one coach to believe in you and that's, that's all you need. So yeah. Luckily, you found that coach relatively early on. Like maybe it was different if you found that coach senior year versus sophomore year, right? But yeah. Uh, so did you do like a lot of the like research and recruiting stuff on your own, or I know some people like have people that they kind of hire to help them or whatnot. Or how did you kind of handle that process? Yeah, um, my recruiting process was one hundred percent done with my own efforts. I didn't I didn't use any services oh. or help from anybody if anything I actually just dm'd current college volleyball players on instagram just asked them questions about it so all the information I gathered I just gathered on my own and then getting recruited I did 100 percent on my own yeah dming current college players <clears throat> I think it's a really good idea too because I think with the sport of volleyball especially like if you're in college and you have access to people most people will see their DMs on Instagram and they will probably answer you, right? I mean, as long as you're yes. asking questions that make sense, you don't seem weird or anything, but like, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good strategy. Like you can literally probably reach out to a lot of college athletes and they will they will answer you. So I think that's a great strategy. So I, I think that part is very cool because a lot of people do think that they need to get these services. Not that they don't help. I'm sure it can streamline things, but yeah, uh, you are able to do it on your own if you want to, right? So that's kind of good to know. But I, I think what I really want to talk about, too, is like, obviously, you are a pretty good player to, to obviously be playing college, but you didn't start out that way. Right. So like, what are the things that you did from, I guess, when you first started playing to make sure you were good enough to make D2 and then eventually go D1? My motto is if I can do it, anyone can do it. And the the main reason that I was able to do it, I think, is because there was a, a long period of time starting in middle school, going throughout high school where I played volleyball seven days a week. And that mm -hmm. included beach, indoor, private lessons, group lessons, and then clinics and summer camps on the weekends. And when I tell people that they might bring up, you know, finances, not being able to afford all of that. But I'm from a, a single parent household. And so every day after school, I would work and that money would go towards paying for those things. So I played volleyball seven days a week as much as I could um, in all different environments and different teams with different coaches just to get a different mindset, different perspective and things like that. And that immediately started to translate when I would go back and play with my team or the next season of JV or or the next season of club. I would immediately like start seeing those improvements made because I was playing every single day, touching a ball every single day. So right. I definitely say the most important thing is just touch the ball as much as possible. Uh, do things that you shouldn't be good at because of your physical disadvantages until you are good at them. So, yeah, yeah that's great. I mean, and I think like, obviously that's a great response. You talked about a lot there, but essentially it comes down to playing a lot, but I don't want to just like make it seem that easy because 
you you said you had to kind of work a job or make extra money as well. Like I also did that in high school too. I, I my parents couldn't pay for clubs, so I had to work at like a, a smoothie shop and one yeah. of my was like holding a sign for this place on like a I was in like a Batman suit. So it was like whatever I had to do. Right? So I'm sure you get that. And I think like I always talk about on, on uh, like my post or my podcast, whatever, about intention being huge. I think because you had to kind of almost help pay for it yourself, you understood the importance of getting the best out of it, right? So I think that is huge yes. for athletes because a lot of people, and I've worked with these clinics too, where if your parents can't afford it, sometimes you just go there and you're just having fun, which is good because blah, blah, is fun, but you're not maybe taking as much as you can, right? So I think a big part of that is surround yourself with as much volleyball as possible, but also make sure that you are being very intentional and, and understand that you're there to get better. Because if if you just kind of go through the motions, it, you're just not going to get as good, right? So I, I imagine you probably were there like, I'm going to try to get better today. I'm going to try to get better today, tomorrow, and so on, right? Yes, for sure. I would say being present in the moment and being grateful for every rep possible is super important. Um, because there are days that you just go through the motions, you just show up and you just get through the day and you won't there, you won't notice as much progress being made than if you go in and have intent with every rep. And that's definitely what I tried to do was take as much away from what I was being told and use it the next time. Like, and, and I've carried that over to this day. Like when a coach tells me something, I try to make that change immediately yeah. Even if even if the third time I do it, it doesn't happen. But the next time I do it, I try to make that change immediately because you'll notice your self tra- like it will translate a lot quicker than if you just kind of go through the motions. So, yeah, no, I think that's huge. And I think even just having a bunch of different coaches is also huge. Like some some players will kind of see the same coach for private lessons for like their whole career. Yeah. It's, it's good to have perspective from different coaches because there's everyone has a little different thing they can add to your game. So I think that's also huge. But the main thing I want to get out of that little section is to tell people who are listening that like, you really have to put in a lot of work if you want to get better. It's not going to, it's not going to happen on its own. Like get your opportunities and then make sure you utilize those opportunities to the best of your ability. Right. And that's not to say that you have to pay for your own club. Like if your parents can't afford your fortune enough, that's great. Just make sure you're like you said, grateful for every rep is what you want to be. I, I think I do want to talk a little bit more about the recruiting itself. So did you just reach out to like, like, were you like thinking like, I want to go like anywhere or were you, were you just contacting all the coaches? What were you doing? Like, what was your, like, your main step to start? I, I think I would say I went a little above and beyond for recruiting. Yeah. What I did isn't really necessary for everybody, but I wasn't picky about location. So I literally put together a list. Well, first of all, I wasn't really being realistic with myself at first. So I started out with all D1 and I was like, let's, let's go ahead and like make this happen. And so I, I emailed almost every division one school possible that had my major. Cause I did research on, I made sure they had my major first. Um, gotcha. Yep. Important. <laughs> yes. And then location didn't matter to me. And so I looked and I saw how many setters they had on their roster calculated if they would need me by the time that I was a freshman in college. And if, it checked off the boxes, I would send an email and I would, I made sure the email was extremely personalized because I think coaches from what I've gathered, like general emails that just kind of are lackluster kind of bother them. So I made sure it was a really yep. important email where I spoke from the heart and I attached my film. And then once I got no responses ever, I <laughs> ended up moving down and so I would email D2 and D3, NAIA. Um, and there there was like not a day that went by that I wasn't working on getting recruited. So I would be in class and I would be sending emails. And then after school, I would make phone calls. So I was constantly working on getting recruited, especially because I kind of felt like I was alone in the process. Like I didn't really have a lot of people that made me feel like it was possible. So I just kind of did it on my own. Mm-hmm. And well, graduating from high school, I had 13 offers, 100% just from my own efforts. And that ranged from D2 and D3. And right. I ended up picking a D2 school. Cool. That's awesome. Yeah, I think, obviously, like we said, it's going to take a lot of work, but it's very doable because you yeah. do it. Others can do it too. I think making a list and organizing yourself is important because 
you need a, some kind of process. And that's really what you're kind of paying for when you do do like services, they give you like a, a process, but you just need like a Word doc or Excel sheet, whatever, yeah. and just make a list. So it's, it's very doable. And then emails are all on Google. So that's where you found them, I'm guessing, right? So yes. Yeah, good. So yeah, you, I had, I had like folders of each school in my Gmail and I had it color coded. So I'd be able to keep track. And I also, this is a little life hack for you guys. Um, <laughs> I don't even know if I should admit this, but I, I downloaded mail track so that I could, it was a Chrome extension. So I could see when coaches were reading my emails and replying or not replying. And if they read it and didn't reply, I would just keep emailing them until I got a response because a no is better than like not knowing. Yeah. So <laughs> that I was very aggressive about it at points, <laughs> um, but I would say it ended up working out in my favor. Yeah. You know, some coaches, uh, would not like that some coaches do and, and that do will, will, will email you back and that's true right yeah. so i think it's not a bad way to do things okay i mean especially if you want yeah so that's good that's awesome um so yeah so you went to your d1 uh, your d2 school right and then you transferred after was it your first year you played a year then you transferred yeah the division two school i picked i was sold on because it was a brand new program and i wanted to be a part of building something yep. um and it was in a really competitive conference. So I went there, kind of made a name for myself, got a lot of stats. And then I wanted to, I'm always shooting for higher. I'm always dreaming bigger. So I went to a, they had just won the conference championship the year before. So I went to another D2 school, kind of moving up in the ranks. Um, and then I learned that just because a program is successful doesn't necessarily mean it's a positive, productive environment. Um, just for me as an individual, I wasn't really thriving. I wasn't growing. I felt like I was kind of settling and I was never going to, you know, become the best version of myself. And I actually started to lose love for the game and I was losing myself. And I was like, you know, you didn't come this far to not be 100 percent happy and getting better every day. And yep. so for all those reasons, I said, if you don't shoot for the stars now, like you'll never know what you can accomplish. So I took a huge risk going in the portal again, hmm. um, which can be a red flag for a lot of coaches that see that. Yeah. But I ended up getting a lot more offers than I expected at the division one level because that was the main goal. And I, I found Towson and it was the most obvious, like it was the most clear choice of all my, you know, recruiting and visits and de decision making. It was like the most clear I've ever been about a decision. Mm -hmm. It was everything I ever wanted. And so I chose Towson and I, I love it so far. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, yeah, I think I don't fully understand how the the transport portal works, but I know that like it's like a whole system that we don't have to really get into, I guess. But it's also something you have to learn about as well in terms of the recruiting process, right? Because a lot of players yeah. think once you get to your school, you're kind of done. Like not necessarily. Once you go to a school, you can leave and go to a different school, right? So yes, and yes, it can be frowned upon depending how how it works out. But for in your in your case, it worked out very well, and, and you're in a spot where you want to be, which is great, like a D one school where you're able to play, right? Um, and we talked about it earlier, how it's a little bit overwhelming, but uh, I, I imagine you're still doing things to try to get better as a player, right? So what kind of things are you doing now at your new program to continue to improve? Yeah, um, I would say like the work that you put in never stops. Even when you accomplish what you want to accomplish, the work, it doesn't stop there. So going in to get extra reps, uh, extra conditioning, even though at the division one level, you're already delivering what feels like your maximum every day, you have to somehow find that bit left in you that you can use to still get better. Um, mm -hmm. Because one of the biggest things I've learned is you'll never get where you want to be by doing what everyone else is doing. So everybody else around me, I've, I always wonder like, how come they can just do this? And they're fantastic. I always had to do the maximum constantly going above and beyond um just to be almost not even caught up to them just kind of right there yeah. you know yeah. so still touching the ball as much as you can staying after coming in early going to the uh student recreation center just to get reps i play with the men's club team at my school sometimes so i just yeah. get extra reps with them so just yeah constantly touching the ball 
it will translate a lot quicker putting in the extra work than just doing what everyone else does coming in the next day and expecting you know, you to get so much better, it's not going to happen. You have to do extra. Yeah. I mean, especially if you are uh, an athlete that is not as physically gifted, whether it be in in your athletic ability, which you can improve. But even then, like there's some people that we all know them, they don't work out and they're just jumping out the gym, right? Or or really tall. So if you have disadvantages like that, you can outwork them, but you really have to like, it's capital work, like all really outwork them. So um yeah, that is something I definitely want people to kind of realize as well, that it, it, it's very possible, but it is hard. Like the coaches that told you that it would be difficult were correct. It's going to be difficult, but yes, difficult, right? So um, that's awesome. I think it's a great story. And I do have like three more questions for you. I usually ask everybody. They're kind of fun questions before we end things here. Okay. Uh, the first one would be like, if you could play any position that is not setter, which one would that be for you? And then why? Um, I would have to say libero. Mm-hmm. Only because my first memory of volleyball, no, not of volleyball, but my first camp that I went to was a Coastal Carolina summer camp um, in my hometown. And I remember I stayed for the defense camp. I signed up for setting, hitting and defense. And during the defense camp, the head coach, he would just chuck balls across the room, yeah. like all the way across the gym. And we were all looking around like, what are we supposed to do with that? <laughs> and he actually was expecting us to go get those and try to get a touch on them. And when his players would demonstrate the drill, they actually were able to touch them. And so I was like, wait, that's so awesome. And so the day that I was able to like get that ball that I thought was impossible, it's like the best feeling ever. So I think playing libero is fun. The adrenaline you get from a good dig or like chasing a ball down. It's so yeah. exciting. Yeah. 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 I think, I think that makes sense too. I think it's fun because you like people, a lot of people would, would choose like hitters, you know, cause you get to get the point, but as a libero, you get to steal someone else's point. Like they think exactly. they got the point and then you're like, no, you're not getting the point. So that's the exactly. other thing. Right. Uh, second question is, um, like if you have any advice for somebody else that is a setter, so you've obviously are a very good setter. Um, what is like something you want to tell another setter that's trying to be good as well? Um, I would say any, anything that anyone could use against you, whether that's your height or, you know, being weak or anything like that. I was always like the shortest, weakest person in the room. I would say like anything that anyone could use against you work on that. So that when the opportunity arises, you actually are able to do it. Like no coach I've worked with ever really wanted me to play front row. I've been a back row setter my whole life. Mm -hmm. So whenever I would go work on my own, I would work on blocking and, you know, being offensive and attacking and things like that. So that when I got the opportunity to play front row, it was like, oh, wait, she's actually not bad at front row, right? Um, even though she is five, eight. And so I would say like constantly touching the ball, working on things that you aren't comfortable with so that they become comfortable. And the most important things is I would say is like your wrists, like arms, wrists, make sure they're strong, just anything you can do to build up strength so that it becomes muscle memory setting should be like muscle memory. I'm the kind of person that if I don't touch a ball for two days, I feel like I completely forget how to set (laughs) and other people, they can go a month and they'll come back and be perfectly fine. So just touch the ball as much as you can. Let it become natural. Good. And then my last question, you kind of answered it, but then you can add a little more. I usually ask like, um, if you have any advice for somebody that is like currently like in an underdog situation where they are maybe doubted by either coaches or other players and you know how can they create their own like success story i would definitely say go outside the box uh don't restrict yourself to one environment one coach constantly work with different people different environments um even if they're lower level or higher level just expose yourself to as much as you can because that will translate really fast when you go back to you know your own environment I would also say don't let anybody, you know, take away your love for the game or ruin your love for the game. Make that, you know, completely up to you and in your control. Don't let anyone decide that for you. And as a setter, I would say like volleyball is mostly mental, like it's super mental. But Mm -hmm. as a setter, I would say that's like one of the most mental positions, because if your mindset's not like 90 to 100 percent, 
things will fall apart. It will be catastrophic. So yeah. just prioritize your mental health as much as you possibly can before you are struggling so that when you do start to struggle, you have developed the techniques and tools to kind of make that change quickly instead of not knowing how to, you know, come back from that. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's great advice. Um, especially like obviously touching the ball as much as you can, even like in different environments, like you mentioned. So like, if you do it in a one-on-one -on -one setting, like with a, with a coach, that's great, but you also want to go to like a clinic and have others around you, even practicing by yourself, you learn things, about yourself that you probably wouldn't get from any other circumstance, right? So like, if you're, even if you're just doing like a wall drill, you might realize like, oh, I have like a tightness in this side of my body or something like that that can yeah. you playing better. So I think the more time you spend in different environments with different coaching, uh, working on your game, it's just going to help you out and benefit you. But, but yeah, I think that's pretty much all I got for this one. I think your story is an amazing one. Um, others, I think will hear it and just realize that it's possible, but it does take a lot of work, like a lot of work. So uh, but if you're willing to do that, you can kind of get there too, you know? So um, right now you are, I think, are you a junior then in college? Right? Yes, I'm a junior. You got this year and then next year as well? You're playing yeah, that? my situation's so complicated because <laughs> it's my third university. So I have to sit out a year and then I have... Gotcha. A, a year of eligibility so i don't know what i am but i i am a junior <laughs> technically i guess yes you're kind of, okay so, you, so this year you're kind of just working on getting getting better getting reps and next year obviously maybe see some game time and, and do that I, I hope so yes yeah okay yep <laughs> that sounds good all right